Hi everyone, my name's Angela Holtberg. I'm a Global Sustainability Director here at Kani, and I'm joined here today by the always amazing Fredrika Klarén. Oh, thank you. Head of Sustainability at Polestar. Yep. Thank you for talking to us today. Thank you for, for having me. So the theme, obviously, of this talk is, uh, is uh, International Women's Day coming up, and we wanted to speak a bit about women's role in in transportation specifically and automotive. Mm. But then since we're both working in sustainability, I figured we'd just sneak in just a little bit of sustainability in there as well. Um, but yeah, let's start by, by talking about you. You're a woman in the <laughs> automotive industry, obviously a very male dominated industry still. Mm. What's your experience uh, being in this, in this role? Well, Polestar was, and it's my only experience in the automotive industry. So I, of course, have a very skewed uh, uh, perspective on it. And, and I, don't, I don't want to at all talk for women at large in the industry, because I do think that all of our uh, experiences are very unique to us as, as people. I came into a very young organization, uh, which had um, decided to really try to build an inclusive culture from scratch. So we are a bit ahead of the curve at Polestar. I think uh, today we are 29% women, 8% that are gender neutral, mm. and the rest of, of those are male. Um, so we have a culture that is coming al along nicely when it comes to inclusion, but we're not at all there, of course, and we have a lot to do. But what I feel uh, being a woman from my perspective in the automotive industry uh, right now is that it's super exciting and that I feel very welcome. I feel like I have a voice at the table, I have a seat at the table, um, and that uh, I work in an organization that uh, is embracing uh, all of our perspectives. So for me, it's very exciting, but I know that there is a lot of women who are struggling around in the industry globally, of course, and that we need to do so much more as an industry. Also for the sake of our businesses, not only to be nice to women, but also to really um, strengthen our businesses and make them more resilient. And I mean, over, over the past few years, we have seen a change in the automotive and transport industry as well. We see more women now in, in senior positions, even, uh, even if it's still a minority. Mm. Um, but at least my sense is that I am meeting more and more women. Uh, I'm seeing more and more women in, in panels and mm. discussion forums. It used to be you came into a room and you were always the only woman mm. and that's not the case anymore I, no. I feel, even though as you say most remains to be done mm. uh, but what would you say are some of the top challenges when it comes to gender diversity and inclusion in transport is it attracting women or is it retaining women or promoting women what what's the challenge why is it moving so slowly uh, what we see at Polestar the 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 major challenge seems to be retention, okay. not attracting. And, and that's been really important for us to learn also and to get insights into, because that's often something that you hear if you mm. work in tech or automotive, in the heavy industries, uh, that for some reason we have not excelled on inclusion due to the fact that women don't want to work in the industry mm. so, or not studying to become engineers. And that's simply not true. Uh, so there is a very good basis from where we can recruit. Mm. Uh, but I do think that it, it is the retention where we really need to do some work and secure that we are really building our businesses uh, in a way that uh, feels, uh, makes women feel comfortable staying, really uh, um, wanting to stay in the company. Mm. So again, um, really building value-driven organizations, speak up cultures, moving from talk to really doing mm. in terms of equal pay, wage mapping, benefits, um, good communication internally, mm. uh, really showing that you mean business when it comes to inclusion. Mm. I love that, more focus on what are you actually doing, not only 
you know, setting a target and, and talking about it. No, I really like that. And what about you? I mean, if we look at you specifically, you've gone from retail, I know you've been in fashion, and, and then came to a very different industry, transport. So mm. what has your journey sort of looked like to end up in the, uh, in the transport industry? Well, it's been a very intuitive journey, I would say. It's not at all something that I plan for. Mm. But I, yeah, I came into sustainability working at IKEA, so with furnishing, retail, then going into fashion and um, loved that, absolutely. But also got a bit nerdy when it came to EVs. Mm. I was kind of an early adapter in in the, in uh, in the industry and and made that choice because it was kind of a plan uh, a part of the climate plan that we set for our family mm. to decarbonize oh, our right. lifestyle uh, and and felt the impact of that both in terms of yeah what it did to our climate emissions but also what it gave me in terms of using these cars mm. and the joy I got from driving them, the ease I got from charging at home, it was just such a great solution. Mm. Um, so I I was really keen on starting to work with that type of powerful solution and bringing the experience that I had from business mm. into helping shaping uh, a young company uh, from the ground up, um, building in sustainability, uh, and yeah, bringing this amazing solution to more consumers. I so, love that. Finding a product you really like and then like, yeah. no, I want to work with yeah. this. So that was the way in and, and uh, yeah, I haven't looked back since. So what are some of the learnings that you took from, from retail and from fashion when you came over to the automotive industry? So working with sustainability in the fashion industry uh, was really made easier because the fashion industry embraced collaboration in a way that the automotive industry still is not capable to do fully. Mm. Uh, and that is because of structural, you know, setups, uh, anti-competition law, of course, mm. that we are very, very um, vulnerable to and, and, of course, needs to respect and so on. That's only one example. Uh, that is not the case in that sense in the fashion industry. So, so, but being able to collaborate and trying to find ways to collaborate mm. is very important for me. Uh, and for example, what we did on, on the Pathway Report together with Rivian, that was one of the, the cases where I really brought the experience I have from the fashion industry in trying to really uh, bring insights to the industry that would mm. be valuable to the industry as a whole, and not only Polestar. Mm. And I mean, we usually say that one of the great benefits of, of diversity inclusion, not only gender perspectives, but all types of diversity, is that you get you get more solutions, right? Mm -hmm. If I have a problem, I put it on the table, I bring 10 people in the room, I want 10 different ways mm -hmm. of solving that problem. But if everyone, you know, looks the same, acts the same, comes from the same place, went to the same school, I'll get 10 very similar uh, similar solutions. Yeah. But what would you say specifically to the automotive industry would be a core benefit of increasing the number of women uh, working in the industry? All that you just said. Um, I mean, homogeneous organizations make bad decisions. Mm. Uh, and we need not only more women, but other uh, diverse perspectives and the diverse perspectives of women also. Mm. Let's be fair, the women don't just bring one strength or one perspective to, no. to the table. So, so uh, that will of course benefit uh, automotive in this very challenging situation that we are finding ourselves in with geopolitical tension, uh, the need to really accelerate into a new technology uh, that needs to uh, really become the norm very soon mm. on, on global markets. Um, that will need the full force of a diverse and nimble and creative and transparent uh, organization. And, and we mustn't forget that as we bring in more diverse teams, mm. the need for inclusive leadership will be even more important 
because we will not only succeed by securing that we have diverse team if no one listens to those voices. Exactly. Um, so that's really important as well. And it comes back to your point about retention, right? Um, I think especially now we see a, a younger generation who also expect to be heard and, and to ex expect to have impact very early in their career. Yeah. So I think any type of leadership that can't cater to those expectations mm. will will struggle to keep the talent that you know they manage to attract. Yes, and 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 this is where you need to be proactive. So we're working with what I hope that all organizations work with today. So trainings for leaders, for mm. organizations, teams. We have uh, we've had a great workshop for all teams uh, on on bias. Um, uh, to really secure that we don't just sit back and rely on that we are all great, you know, uh, people who have the right values and uh, mm. and uh, think that inclusion is important, but that we really learn about how we can utilize this and secure that we do what we talk about. Mm. No, no, and it's and it's for everyone, right? I uh, remember my first training when it comes to bias. I definitely had a tendency to, you know, to favor the minimis uh, ah, because yeah. it's very comfortable. It's something you know, right? Mm. I understand how these people function, yeah. But it doesn't give me the variety of of problem solving that I probably uh, would need. You mentioned the uh, the situation the industry is facing mm -hmm. now with the challenges. It's a it's a big transition that we're looking at, right? New mm -hmm. technologies, regulatory push, consumer push towards more sustainable solution. Mm -hmm. This is my not so smooth segue into talking <laughs> about sustainability mm -hmm. because that's what we want to work with, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. <laughs> Across, you know, your experience, first in, in retail and then fashion, now automotive, would you say your, your like, view on sustainability or even definition of, of sustainability has changed over the years or changed depending on, on the industry you're in? Actually, it hasn't. Mm. Um, my I still really love the term sustainability. Mm. Uh, and I know that it's being challenged on um, in in many areas, and and we're even you know we have in society today you know polarization, and uh, there's also a growing skepticism towards the term sustainability, mm. uh, which makes me even more um, um, you know. I, I really want to keep that definition intact. And mm. it, it was set out by the UN mm. uh, early in the 90s. And that definition really holds. Mm. So to me, that hasn't changed. But of course, my perspective on it has changed. Uh, I've, I've really had a very exciting time working with sustainability, uh, where we have gone from, you know, focusing on, you know, making things more efficient and and really... Uh, doing less bad to uh, now seeing the full potential that sustainability brings in terms of innovation and mm. business value and new business models. And so, so absolutely my perspectives and my expectations on sustainability has changed. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, also with age, right? As you as you start off, it's all enthusiasm and passion, and you you know want to do something. And mm. then as I think as you get older, but also more senior in your career, and have to start really making you know harder decisions when mm. it comes to sustainability in business specifically. Uh, thinking of more like challenging crucial business models mm. and, and products and, and really start integrating it in everything and not just, you know, doing something nice on the side. Yeah. Um, I think also for me, the, my perspective of how we need to work with it has changed over yeah. the years. Even if the, the Brundtland definition as mm. such still, I think I agree with you. It, still it holds up. Yeah, hey. she did a great work. Oh, she did, she did. And, yeah. and for those of you who don't know, that would be that uh, to, uh, to basically use resources in a way that allows also for future generation to meet their needs. Yeah. Um, so we don't use too much uh, or ruin it for generations to come. And also 
bringing in the the social issues so not only resources and environmental but also the social dimension also to secure that that develops in a way that mm. supports uh, future uh, generations so I mean research shows us that actually a majority of, of senior and executive leaders in sustainability are women. Yeah. So this is an area where, where we find all the way up to the C-suite level that, that women are in majority, not a large one, I think roughly 56, uh, 58, 60%. Mm. So why do you think that is in, in your view? You know, mm. I, I don't expect you to have the answer to, to no. everything, but why is women <laughs> driving this this? disruption that it is? I, I don't think that we're more purpose-driven than men. I don't think the answer lies in that. I, I don't think that we, for some reason, want to uh, work with sustainability to a greater extent than men. I absolutely see that men and, and uh, you know, uh, people in general uh, have the same inclinations towards it. I actually think, and this is my, my, my own um, thinking, that we see a fairly new function in organizations. It's mm. still quite young as a, as mm -hmm. a profession yeah. where we've had the ability to really utilize, um, you know, the, the situation we had in, you know, kind of 10, 15, 20 years ago where women were able to come into mm. this, to this void uh, mm. that was created uh, and where we didn't have built-in structural Right, no uh, legacy. Hinders, no legacy. Yeah. Much like what we're seeing at Polestar when mm. we're trying, we don't have a, a legacy organization. We, need, we can build our organization from the ground up. Yeah. And, and I would say 58% is not a majority. I mean, it's, you could say it's equal. Slight yeah. majority. Yeah, yeah, slight majority. <laughs> yeah. And what do you think are some of the, the, the critical, like, must get right mm. when it comes to to sustainability in organizations for and not thinking about you know 2040 2050 but mm. just really in the in the coming 3 to 5 years mm. what's crucial mm. that businesses get right when it comes to sustainability agenda I mean, the, the most criti critical thing now is that we don't have time to sit around and think mm. about this we have to do mm. and we have to be very focused in our work it has to make sense for the business mm. if we build a sustainability agenda that somehow doesn't really tap into what you are here to offer mm. as as a business then you're not going to get the drive that you need and the drive is needed to accelerate of course because we we don't make the time plan here as businesses no. we have the uncomfortable situation on being on the planet's timeline plan, um, you know, in terms of the climate crisis that we're meeting, the biodiversity loss, the growing inequalities, mm. the increased geopolitical tension. So somehow now it is crucial for organizations and businesses to really create a sustainability agenda that takes uh, speed into account and also business value. Mm. Um, and that so means basically not a sustainability agenda, but just sustainability as a strong, uh, you know, integral part of, of your business, business. Yeah. focusing on what you're offering. Is it a product? Is it materials? What is, and, and also really something that I love stepping into this area in a way is, is being able to prioritize, mm. uh, and, and also working at Polestar being very driven from within and not too anxious about what anyone else is asking us to do or um, you know what 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 you know a legacy that we would have mm. to uphold but really thinking about it from the inside out and making hard prioritizations and for us it's all about you know materials innovation bringing this technology uh, and and making great cars performance cars and would you say for, for your industry specifically that that's the most critical thing to start thinking about? Yes, the technological shift uh, then from fossil fuels to other solutions, but also you mentioned, you know, the things around the materials that goes into the car and everything around the car as well. Yeah, for the, for the, for the transportation sector now, I mean, we, we have to get over, you know, talking about the, the, the electrification. 
that is just the beginning. Mm. Now we are really standing in front of something that is very exciting for us as an industry, being able to really uh, shape a new industry going forward uh, with electrification as a basis. Mm. And that means, you know, innovation on materials, uh, building more transparent uh, ways of working towards our customers and, and within our companies, uh, being able to really... Um, collaborate in a bit in a better way mm. uh, we can really utilize this this change we're in to redefine a lot of things mm. and that's yeah. what's so exciting and i think I, it's part of the reason why why i also choose to work in in this field of course is that with disruption comes a lot of opportunity and a lot of innovation and creativity and it's a it's a really exciting space to be in when you start challenging some core you know, functions of an entire industry to yeah. say like, mm, is, there, is there maybe a better way of doing it mm. or a different way of doing it? Mm. So I agree. You mentioned transparency and I, I want to just quickly touch on that because obviously um, as we see now, you know, the automotive industry going towards uh, battery electric, uh, we talk more and more now also about the social impact. So the the S and the ESG, if you will, and and how to connect, you know, the um, the focus on, on on greenhouse gas emissions with also the the social impact. Mm. What do you see in in the in in this industry would be important to note when it comes to social impact and connecting the two. Mm. Uh, I really think it's about more unveiling the inherent connection between E and S rather than connecting them. Mm. Uh, when we uh, promote human rights, we also really promote diversity and will enable for a speedier uh, transition and, and braver decisions on on environment. You know, when, for example, when we get more diverse organizations that mm. we have spoken a lot about here, uh, I do think that we will be able to really take action on environmental impacts mm. in a greater way. Uh, it really means it really needs that type of diverse uh, decisions to be able to make those bold mm. decisions. So, um, so. And also vice versa. I mean, when we when we take action to when we take action on climate change, or when we take action to really um, uh, work with resource efficiency, we will also uh, promote local communities, human rights, equality. Mm -hmm. It's so interconnected to me uh, that it's not we cannot separate. So I, I do think that as organizations, you should have clear requirements on, on and targets towards environment and, of course, towards social issues. And when you do, you will see that those will really work in tandem mm. and they will propel and reinforce each other uh, in a great way. That's what I've seen from my years working with sustainability, that they are so interconnected. No, oh, I agree. You can't save the people without sending the planet and vice versa. But also it's an excellent way to, to future-proof your supply chains and, yes. you know, build a very resilient supply chains to address these risks uh, head on. Uh, and to your point, I think transparency will really help us to tackle some of the issues we're having. Yeah, for me, that's one of the core functions of a, a sustainability work, to mm. build resilience yeah. for the company. Uh, it will do much more than that, but that for me, that's one of the core. So we're coming up at time, uh, yeah. and I wanted to, to ask you why. It's a classical question, but it's a classic for a reason. So what piece of advice would you give to women looking at the transport and automotive industry and thinking, you know, could I build, could I build a career in that? You need, you need to really um, Trust that what you're bringing, your, all of your perspectives, experience, and your passions, uh, and that they will really uh, benefit the, the company that you work for. Uh, that is what I really want women uh, to reaffirm all of the time, to, to not doubt themselves, but to really go for what they believe in and what they want to do. Mm. And uh, that is easier said than done. And for my self, I've had to reaffirm this time and time over because you will come in 
to situation where you feel like an imposter or you feel like you are targeted or you're not valued. Absolutely. Um, so really being true uh, to yourselves and being very clear on what your passion is will help you. Mm. But just go for it. Don't hold anything back. Uh, that That's my only advice that I can give. It's a solid advice. Know mm. your value and just go for what you're passionate about and what you want to do. Yeah. Um, that will make your career sustainable as well, I think. Because if you go to work having fun and enjoying the environment, then it's going to be a long career. It will hold over time. Absolutely. I can attest to that. <laughs> Fredrika, thank you so much uh, for taking the time and talk to us. And thank you for all your great insights. Thank you, Angela. And thank you for everything that you're doing. You're such an inspiration to me. Well, I'm surrounded by genius women. Thank you all so much for dialing in and hope to see you soon again. <laughs>